G'day everyone and welcome to the Happy, Saved and Free podcast. My name is James and I believe the gospel is good news. Unfortunately, it hasn't always been proclaimed that way, but that's why we're here. Hey, I'd love it if you come join me on my blog at happysavedfree.com. Also come check me out on Facebook and Instagram at Happy Saved Free as well. Today on the show, I've got an awesome guest. His name is Brad Jerzak. And if you don't know him, he is the... Uh, was it the reader and monastery preacher at an Orthodox monastery. Uh, he is an author and he is a lecturer as well. His, uh, his books that he has written has had a huge impact on my life, including the first one, which was called, Can You Hear Me? Taught me about how to hear the voice of God. Completely revolutionized my prayer life. And then the second one that he did was called A More Christ-Like God, A More Beautiful Gospel. And that one completely revolutionized the way that I understood the cross and what all that meant. So in today's episode, Brad answers the question, what is the gospel? He breaks it down for us. And we look at what it looks like to be Jesus-centered, what a Jesus-centered picture of the cross and of salvation means, and what a Jesus-centered way of living looks like. I had a great chat with Brad. I really enjoyed it. And I think you're going to enjoy it too. So here we go. Well, Brad, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. <laughs> um, Brad, I have been a huge fan of yours for a number of years. Um, started off when I first read your book, Can You Hear Me? And I just found that as I read through those pages and did the exercises that you had there, I was having these encounters with God. And then I was like, oh, wow, that was strange. And then I'd go back to the book and it would say, now, often when you do this, this would happen. <laughs> and it was sort of like that every step along the way in that book, um, what you said would happen, happened, <laughs> which was absolutely fantastic. And it just opened me up um, to this God who was so personal and interested in my life. So I just want to say thank you for that because that book made a huge difference. Um, but then you've had some other books that have made a huge difference in my life as well. So I just want to say thank you for that. And um, and so I'm really excited to have you here, and I'm looking forward to sharing that with all our listeners. Um, but to kick it off, Brad, I'm wondering if you can maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself. Maybe if we start with your family and where you live and what you're up to these days. Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm married to a wonderful wife of 30-some years now. Her name is Eden, and uh, we have three adult sons, and uh, the oldest of those is married in Toronto, Canada. Uh, our second son right now is with his daughter in, in Korea. And my youngest son is here in Abbotsford and he has his own place. And, and uh, so, uh, so that's, we've got some, some uh, our first grandchild, obviously. So that's been wow. wonderful. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah. Awesome. And, and Brad, what do you like to do for fun? I like hiking or walking and reading. And awesome. so... Uh, even though I'm not shy, I'm a bit of an introvert in terms of I'm restored in solitude, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, so I I enjoy I enjoy hunkering down by a fireplace with a good book, or going out on my own for a walk in the in the woods. Awesome, awesome, that's great. And um, I, I'm really interested. I actually saw a post that you put on Facebook uh, this morning, my time. I think it's afternoon your time, <laughs> um, but. Uh, I like to ask people reflecting on both Paul quoting Isaiah <laughs> saying, how beautiful are the feet that bring the good news to us. Do you want to maybe just share with us, Brad, who, who's been the beautiful feet in your life? Yeah. Um, so I want to say right from the outset that I think, you know, the good news is Jesus and he's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Um, the way we share about Jesus may vary. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, uh, so initially, my parents shared with me yeah. the person of Jesus, not an idea, not a doctrine, mm. not even the sinner's prayer they taught me to pray, but a, um, a living presence who would live in me. And so I felt that living connection from the time I was a little Baptist boy. Uh, I would also say I, I received uh, beautifully good news when I first encountered some folks in the Vineyard Church, mm. uh, especially my wife's cousin, Mike Rempel, and for, he was a very prophetic fellow. And so I, I just began to see um, through his friendship 
uh, that that God is a loving Father, and that holiness itself is intimacy with yeah. the Father. Yeah. Uh, rather than sort of legalism or moralism, it, it is proximity to a loving Father, whose lap you can sit on. And He taught me that you can that uh, you can sit down and have coffee with God, <laughs> and that that is prayer. And this was huge yeah. for me. It it began to be a friendship. Um, <clears throat> There's been many others, but I'll say one more at this point. Uh, Archbishop Lazar Pujalo, a, a monk who looks a lot like Gandalf, um, <laughs> he he taught me that the, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, which now I'm I'm streaming with, uh, they 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 believe that God is love only. No, God is never love, but also yeah. any other attribute of God is always a facet of His infinite love. And so my experience of God has, has really been um, a, one of, of unrelenting mercy. Mm. And in that sense, in all of these cases, the living connection I discovered through my mom and dad, the, that sort of prophetic, inti intimate <clears throat> connection with Abba, Abba Father, and now this idea of, of an all-merciful God, uh, I, I guess the, the beautiful feet were Jesus himself showing me the nature of God as exactly like him and that to see him is to see the father so that's that's maybe a good summary of my journey thus far love it <laughs> i love it I, what i've been saying to people lately and i think it's it's fairly similar to the journey that you've just described was so my parents that they, they were missionaries and so um they always taught me again about the person of jesus it's not just a doctrine or something that we're trying to believe he's a person to believe in and to believe what he says. Um, but then I, I guess as I grew up, I, I knew about prayer, but I, I guess when I started reading your book, it was about, he would actually answer, like he would actually respond. And that was a huge, uh, a huge shift for me that I was alluding to before. But then I guess more recently, um, over the past few years, I feel like my theology is now catching up <laughs> to my experience of the goodness of God. Uh, like I've always experienced God to be this loving, this loving dad or this loving God who is right there with you. And um, I've seen God, you know, in extreme poverty um, when I lived overseas and then with my work here with uh, compassion and stuff that I do. Um, I've always known God to be good, but there was always that, but <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to get on his bad side <laughs> or, right. but if you, if you don't believe in him, you, there could be some trouble for you down the track. <laughs> right, right. That's always been an issue, I think, these caveats. And so that's what I love about the Eastern Orthodox tradition. It's, if, you know, there's 30, 350 million of them. And I think a lot of them have lost the plot too, right? But, but uh, doctrinally, mm. you know, maybe they could stand to catch up in yeah. practice what they have in, in this, the early church doctrine that... Well, that comes right out of John and First John, that the God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Yeah, and that there is no bad side of God you can get on, <laughs> because because infinite this infinite spring of mercy is is flooding into the world. Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount, um, to the righteous and the unrighteous, even to the ignorant and rebellious. Yeah. He is indiscriminately gracious. And, and you're like, what? Um, and of course, we see that in the life of Christ, but we, I, I don't know, we import these other ideas of God. I think we built them out of our own shame. Yeah. Remember yeah. in the Garden of Eden, um, when Adam and Eve stumble, they, they feel shame and their first instinct is to hide from God. Yeah. He had never given them reason to hide before. And um, he had warned them that the fruit was fatal, but that's like my mom warning me the stove is hot. So why as a child, when I burnt my hand on the stove, did I go hide? Well, out of the shame, I create this image of some, someone who I need to hide from. But, so, uh, but Christ comes to set that straight, and, and he shows us that um, God is the, is, is the one you run home to, even if you've wandered out into the pig pens and so on. So I love that. And... Um, you just said God shows us. I, I think that's a, a title of your uh, your kid's book. Yeah, Jesus showed us. Jesus um, showed us. <laughs> he showed us that God is love. Yeah. Would you, 
so if we were summing up the gospel, like what is the good news? Is that how you would sum it up? Uh, there, you know, it depends on who I'm talking to. So even in Luke four, when Jesus is announcing the gospel in Nazareth, he, he says, well, to, you know, I, it's, it's recovery of sight to the blind. It's good news for the poor. It's what, but um, one way I like to summarize it is this, that if there is a God, and I say if as a faith statement, not a doubt statement. Yeah. It's a faith, but it is a faith statement. I won't prove in a lab or a courtroom. Yeah. If there's a God, that God is love. And if you want to know what that love looks like in its purest form, you look at Jesus. Mm. And as you look at Jesus, that God is revealed in clearest focus on the cross as self-giving, radically forgiving, co-suffering love. This is all good news. Then the invitation is to surrender yourself to that kind of loving care. Yeah. And so this is what I do. And, you know, it's part of 12 step recovery, the Alcoholics Anonymous and so on. Step three is we, we made a decision to surrender our lives and our will to the care of a loving God, you know, mm-hmm. that, um, and so it's not that anything we do makes him love us. It's that he, we love him because he's already loved us and that we're calling people into an experience of what is already theirs in yeah. Christ. Yeah. So that's one way I might talk about the gospel. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, oh man, you, you're just sort of making my mind uh, sort of go in a couple of different places. There was this, um, I think one of the, the key parts of what you just said to me was that, I guess in the past I've seen God as merciful and loving on the cross, but I hadn't attributed what he was doing on the cross as, well, God is always like this. Like yes. God has always been Christ-like and specifically Christ on the cross like <laughs> yes that that is our hermeneutic and so yeah. <clears throat> which means in the interpretive lens through which we read the bible through which we know god is actually the lamb yeah uh, slain and risen and so so we're not saying that's one side of god or an aspect of god we're saying that that this is how we know god yeah uh, Christ reveals God in himself, especially and ultimately on that cross and as pure love. And so this, I'm just getting this out of first John again. It's like, here's how, here's what is God? God is love. What does this love look like? It looks like a cross. How, how can it be a cross? Well, cause the cross is the place where Jesus showed us that, that God is setting things right, not through coercion, or through wrath and violence, but, but through um, undergoing the human condition and then mm-hmm. even forgiving us uh, rather than wrathing us when we were at our very worst, right? Yeah. So he descended into our darkness and shone his light there. If he can do that then, he can do it everywhere, all the time for everyone. And, and that's one of the, I think that's one of the things that we often miss out in the I guess in gospel presentations or when we're trying to explain the gospel, you just sort of talk about descending into death or descending into Hades. We've got this sort of picture that very rarely do we sort of talk about it. I think it's in, um, isn't it in one of the creeds that even like, it's right there. Like that's, that's what we believe that Jesus went down and sort of set the captives free and stuff. And it's like, we've forgotten that, that aspect of the, of the good news, would you maybe just elaborate on what what you think that means? Sure. Um, so, first of all, I think maybe we forgot it on purpose because mm. it's such <laughs> good news that we lose our leverage, which yeah. we thought was like threat of the threat of hell and the threat of death, which is the very thing he set us free from. Yeah. So, in the Apostles' Creed, which is affirmed by, you know, uh, uh, both Catholic and Protestant churches, the whole Latin West, it says that, that Christ, by the way, so when we say creed, what we're talking about is the apostolic summary of the gospel. Yeah. When Jude talks about the faith once delivered, or when Paul talks about the gospel we received, mm. that is, that's what the creed is. It's, yeah. It is remembering what Paul and James and others, how they identified the gospel, the faith. And so and so they, so you would, 
you would affirm this creed, this gospel at your baptism. And then you would affirm it again every single time you worshiped. So this is, they're helping us to remember the gospel. Even when you have corrupt churches and priests and so on, you're still saying the creed, still yeah. saying the creed, <laughs> that Christ suffered and he died under Pontius Pilate, he descended into hell, and he was raised from the dead. So what does this mean? Well, um, there's different interpretations, but all of, all of those interpretations in the East and West are that he conquered death in Hades. Yes. And, and the idea, the, the narrative that'll go with it is that when Christ died, uh, Paul says he descended into the lower parts of the earth. And then when he ascended, he led with him a parade of captives. He set them free. Peter's version of that is that when he died, he preached the good news, evangelized um, the, the, the souls of, of those who were judged in the flesh at the time of the flood, and he made them alive in the spirit. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. And then Jesus' version of that is that he, that, that he is going to bind the strong man, enter his house, and plunder his goods. So the strong man is Satan, his house is Hades, and his goods are the people. And so in, in, in this ancient tradition, that was very central to the gospel. And that's why it gets into the creed uh, that he conquered death to rescue the dead. You know, of course, that doesn't work very well with our hellfire threats, does it? And so I think we kind of set it aside or reinterpret it in other ways. But in my church, we sing hymns about the conquest of death through the death of Christ every single Sunday. It's part of our resurrection narrative and it's all one thing death descent and resurrection then yeah. it's it's all a victory over over um the, the kingdom of darkness really and it's not just about the afterlife it's about my life now i don't need to be afraid of death anymore he has renovated death into a place of doom and non-being into a doorway into eternal life so um that's really good news it's beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. What I'm wondering if, if would you better share a little bit about like what is the link between Satan and death, or Satan and and Hades, as you just mentioned there. Well, whatever Satan is, <laughs> um, <laughs> the the link is described, and I'm going to read it for you. Um, the, the link is described in Hebrews uh, chapter two towards the end and it's talking about the resurrection or it's talking about the, the incarnation and the why of it right <clears throat> and he says this um this is hebrews 2 starting at verse 14 inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood that's us we have we we have flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same why so here's the question why did Christ do that? Why did he become human? That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So what the author of Hebrews seems to be doing there is he's saying, as there was a time when death reigned and it, um, death was a ticking time bomb, mm. And, and death was something we were so afraid of that it actually, our fear of death was slavery that generated sin. That, and that as long as that fear of death and death itself were in play, then the enemy had leverage over you. And now he's got nothing. It's like, what are you going to do? Kill me? I already died at my baptism and was raised with Christ. Um, oh, I'll, I'll depart. I'll fall asleep. I'll move on. I'll ascend. But die? No, that's not a thing anymore. And I, I love this idea of I, I have a conversation in my imagination with Jesus where he says to me, um, the word from the Gospels, he, he says, you know, unless a seed dies and falls into the ground, it can't sprout and bring forth fruit, right? And I, as if he doesn't know, but I would tell him, but the seed doesn't actually die, you know. <laughs> and and then he responds exactly. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I I just find it I just find it really funny that you know if Jesus came to take away the fear of death, 
how can how, how can our gospel presentation be trying to make people scared of death? <laughs> yeah, in fact, like it, it doesn't. It not. actually doesn't match up. <laughs> right, because uh, think about Romans eight. At the end of Romans eight, it says, "Death can't separate you from the love of God." Yeah. <laughs> it, it can't. And so, um, a good ex a good exercise I have all my students do at the university. I have them go through the Book of Acts, and they have to find every occurrence of the gospel preached, whether it's to an individual or a group, Jew or Gentile, and they have to write down what was the gospel they preached. Yeah. And outline what's always there or sometimes there and surprisingly not there. Yeah. What is never there is a, is a threat of, of death or hell. It's, yeah. it's not in any gospel presentation. So we have changed the gospel if we are using that as leverage. Yeah. We are in the ministry of condemnation because that's the very leverage Satan had pulled out from under him. And now we're using it in the in evangelism? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Get behind me, Satan, you know? <laughs> I, I used to have this real struggle because I, I had this revelation of the goodness of God, and I, I wanted to share that with people. Um, and I, I could do that, but then I was always trying to get people to come to, like, repentance and belief, as I knew it back then, or I wanted them to you know, say the sinner's prayer. I wanted them to, because for me, that, that was the doorway into, into knowing God. Um, right, and I right. Thought. But in your latest book, um, A More Christ-like Way, you yeah. have this fantastic little, little section there that I, I think is just brilliant, which is, uh, I think you start with um, John three sixteen. whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. But then James says, oh, you believe? Good. Even the demons do. <laughs> and yeah. then I think you move on to, uh, you know, if you confess um, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. But then Jesus says, well, many will call me Lord. And, you know, <laughs> and then you go, well, it can't be that. Well, maybe it's faith. But then James says, faith without Jesus dead. Right. <laughs> it's just like this. Well, what? What is that? And uh, the only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. Mm. And I, I just absolutely loved that because I, I feel like this, it's, not just a doctrine to believe that gets you in now. It's a, a person to have relationship with and a way of living to experience it now and forever. Yes. Through trust. Yeah. Through trust. Yeah. Right? Believe yeah. what he says and, and trust him. And, and that it absolutely, it's not about getting a right doctrine or and necessarily even behavior. Right. But this will all flow. It will flow from a, um, a trusting relationship with a real person who loves us with an everlasting love yeah yeah and i think this is where uh, like I, I know brad like um particularly your book her, you know her gates will never be shut and <laughs> and um probably some of the company um that you keep with guys like paul william young and um these other sort of guys and i think often when people are looking at the sort of um belief around the gospel that that, that we hold, they imagine it that, well, what does, where does faith, where does repentance, like where does, where does our part come into it as if, as if it doesn't matter. But I'm hearing from you, Brad, that it absolutely, like our surrender absolutely matters. It absolutely matters. And, <laughs> and while I don't threaten people with, uh, right. with, uh, with, with the fear of death or hell, I do believe that we will all pass through the fire of love there is a forthcoming judgment that will burn up everything in us that's not love. Um, so what a waste it would be to use my life on that which will be burned up and consumed. Yeah. What moths and rust can eat and all of that. And so um, I take seriously the responsibility of our freedom yeah. to use it for love now, to commit ourselves that... Um, love, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. And so I, I think sometimes fo folks think that, well, you know, if you overemphasize love, then people will just go do what they want. And they, like, first of all, you can't overemphasize infinite, <laughs> infinite love. And second, people do do what they want. Yeah. But if they're going to do what they want out of love for God and love for each other, that's going to generate something beautiful. Mm. But if they, if they do what they want with a gun pointed to their head, <laughs> right? Is that a willing faith response to Jesus? Or is that just blackmail? 
yeah. do this or, or I will not just kill you. I will burn you forever. Okay, I'll do it. Well, that's not a heart that's been won. It's just a heart that's been taken hostage to fear. Yeah. And that just perpetuates the whole scenario in the garden. Yes. It, it just keeps going and going and it's not actually true freedom. It's not actually, you don't actually get to experience the life that, that God has for you when it's like that. Um, yeah. I think it's also part of the, um, the rhetoric that's going on in Romans chapter one and two, where you've got statements about God's wrath. So you're, yeah, but the wrath of God is being revealed. And, and then Paul responds to that. Oh, don't you remember? It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, Romans 1 and 2 are not a case for the wrath of God. They're a case for remembering that, that uh, what wrath could never do, kindness has. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I, I think th the thing I love about, about your books and the things that you've been sharing, Brad, is how God has always looked like Jesus and Jesus on the cross and so when you look at Jesus on the cross, uh, I can now go back throughout, throughout scripture and particularly throughout the gospels and look at Jesus and say, oh, wow, he's, that's him. Like that, that the same uh, essence of Jesus on the cross or that same love that he had on the cross is demonstrated in both his teaching and his life. Um, yeah. And I loved how you, you really drew that out in, in your book. Um, and, and sort of, I think you quoted... Um, one of the popes saying that that the beatitudes is like the autobio is the veiled autobiography of jesus <laughs> yes that's right I love that. yeah that was pope benedict the 16th and if you look through um if you look through the beatitudes it, it really is the life of christ and especially you can find those beatitudes expressed um especially in the passion narratives mm. And that you see po poverty of spirit is when he empties himself. Uh, you know, he, he puts aside privilege and he undergoes affliction um, and says no to ego and surrenders to the will of his father. You know, there's poverty. And yeah, yeah. the mourning that you see for the world, he's in Gethsemane. He's not afraid of dying. Lots yeah. of martyrs die gra graciously, right? We're, what we're seeing is mourning for the whole world and bearing the sorrows of all humankind throughout history and and the mourning that comes from that and then and and then his meekness it's power under control for the sake of goodness and you just go through and you yeah. go oh this is the character of christ these are the fruit of the spirit revealed in christ um the, this is the life of discipleship of mm -hmm picking up your cross. What's picking up your cross look like? What well, it looks like the Beatitudes. Oh, Christ-likeness. So yeah. follow me, he says. And, and it's tough. Like when you think about like, blessed are the persecuted or, or blessed are, are the peacemakers. Like these are um, counter-cultural ways of living that are like, you can't, I mean, e even in, in large sections of the church today being a peacemaker and having that non-violent witness that we read about in the sermon on the man and then obviously jesus um not fighting back when he could have um i mean he was being taunted like well if you are the son of god you know how about jump yeah. down you know come yeah. and get me you know <laughs> and in my mind i sort of think if there was ever a time when when god did want to be wrathful and he did want to smite someone it would probably be when Jesus is naked upon the cross, he's being tortured, he's being, you know, he's being um, provoked, you know, people are mocking him. I would think that's probably the time to do it. Um, but instead we hear the forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. It's right. Right. And even when, you know, when he's resurrected, he could have just come out resurrected and say, okay, now we're going to crush Rome Here we go. and we're going to crush the <laughs> temple. And we're gonna, gonna wipe out the Sanhedrin, and we're gonna wipe out, uh, you know, Pilate's soldiers, and we're in fact we're gonna march all the way to Rome and, and overthrow the emperor. He just doesn't do it that way because that's not how God works. Yeah, yeah. And so, can you can you maybe just? I've heard a little bit of your story before about how that nonviolent, um, I guess, belief or, or way of living. Um, how you sort of came to, came to that. Would you be able to maybe share that? Because I think, 
I think for a lot of us, we, we have grown up with a violent God, a, a violent, um, retributive God. Um, and then we've also had these passages that do talk about peace, but then we've also, but we've always got that caveat there because, well, but yeah, Jesus is peace, but you know, it's like that, that, but comes in again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that is because we don't want to give up our own right to violence in whatever situation we think would finally warrant it. You know, yeah. well, well, Hitler, or well, if someone comes in my house, or well, if, and it's like, um, right where it counts most, we abandon the, the way of peace. Yeah. And so what happened with me is I grew up in a family where uh, we, we had military members in the family. Um, one of my grandfathers was a sniper. Um, uh, two of my uncles served in World War II and so on. And, um, and so I kind of grew up with that. Uh, in Canada, though, we wouldn't glorify it like you'd say maybe in, in, in America. But um, I was really into my G.I. Joes and my action figures and my soldiers. <laughs> <clears throat> and then um, I ended up, the, my first call into ministry was to a Mennonite church and my, my wife's home church where, the, you know, fundamentally they believed in nonviolence and in the, specifically from uh, the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, but also the prophecies of Isaiah that were fulfilled in Jesus, mm. not someday in heaven, but when in the new covenant, you dismantle weapons of war and transform them into instruments for farming or whatever. Um, and that's not someday in, uh, that's, that's when Jesus shows up and says, today, this is fulfilled in me. Yeah. So, and then proceeds to give you a fairly clear, not fairly, he gives you an overtly clear instructions for how to treat enemies, uh, with love, with blessing, with prayer that we, Paul says that we'd overcome evil, but only always with good and never with the weapons of this world. So you've got all of that in place, but I didn't buy it because I still had the caveats in my heart. I had not yet repented in, in it. I didn't trust Jesus' words. Mm. I did not trust those words. I thought we need to make them exceptional or provisional or whatever. Um, and so I would argue this, this about the Mennonites. Here I am in a Mennonite church and I'm arguing with them and I, w I could not hear them. And then um, within the course of, Oh, it was just a few months. I had a series of events that happened. I'll just tell you a couple of them. One was I was watching Apocalypse Now for the third time. And there, and there is a moment in it when the uh, U.S. Uh, Marines end up slaughtering all these people, innocent civilians in a fishing boat. And something in my head just clicked. And I went, that always happens in war. War makes that inevitable for every side. There's no good guys. Yeah. And then the same month I had been preaching and kind of made some remarks that, that glorified the allied win in World War II. I don't know what on earth I was thinking. You don't <laughs> do that in a Mennonite church full of German speaking people. But little grandma Redekop came up to me and this is a, a, a little tiny German elderly woman and she's, she told me, I don't remember now what town she was or if she even told me, but she said she, as a girl, she was in Nazi Germany and the Allied bombers were just, were dropping their bombs on, on a civilian targets mm -hmm. three days after they surrendered. And she said, don't tell me that was good guys, <laughs> you know, and and so that began unraveling and I just mm -hmm. began to see God is not a death dealer. God is a life giver. And those who, those who are committed to his kingdom now will fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah where it says they, they won't even train for war anymore. And I know that's offensive to those whose families have invested yeah. in, in militarism. And well, so did mine. And I'm just saying, I'm not willing to see our sons and daughters sacrificed on the altars of the God of Mars, the God of war yeah, yeah. or the God of capitalism or the God of whatever it is. And, and then it's like, well, but what about Hitler? It was the church disobeying Christ that brought Hitler to power and served in his armies. And so where does it stop? 
right? Yeah. It's it, well, it stops now. How about now? So that's where I, you know, you can hear I have conviction about that, but it's not <laughs> the conviction of a hippie. It's the conviction of someone who grew up bullied, who has a lot of violence in his heart. And I know the slavery of violence and I know how violence escalates and I know how it demands the sacrifice of the other. And, uh, and I, and I repent and I'm repenting because I still have to cleanse that out of my heart. It rises up very naturally from the flesh in yeah. someone who'd been bullied. And so, uh, so, so that's where I'm coming from on it. It's, it's sort of like, when you've been an addict to something, right? And, and you're like, do not take that drug. It yeah. will kill you. And I've been told I'm dangerously naive. Even when I'm qu citing Jesus, I'm, I'll, I'll yeah. quote yeah. Jesus. And a Christian will tell me I'm naive. And I'm I'll tell you what's naive. A $3 trillion budget for war, thinking that'll fix the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's dangerously naive. And, and, I find, and this is... It, it, I mean, when I th think about this sort of thing, it always surprises me that as Christians, like that we have these violent ideas because this is exactly what the early church in Jesus' day were going through. Like they, they were like, they were under Roman rule. They knew what it was to be in slavery. You know, they always remembered what it was like to be in slavery. They, they, understood, um, they understood how bad it could get. Um, they were constantly retelling these stories and they were wanting the God of wrath to come in. They were wanting Jesus to come in on a horse and wipe out the bad guys as if that would solve the world's problems. But right. Jesus chose a different way, <laughs> a different way uh, to do that. And, and a lot of the comments that I get uh, when I talk about the what Jesus way of peace and how his uh, followers of Jesus, that that's our way too. Um, I get the same comments, James, it's just really naive. <laughs> but I just sort of think it's a lack of imagination. Like, who would have thought that Jesus dying under by the Romans would be able to turn that into the greatest victory of all that would completely change the whole entire world? Like, I, there's got to yeah. be some sort of creativity there. <laughs> yeah, and for those who think that's naive, they also they also have probably not really tasted violence or been experienced um experienced violence in in a significant way if 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 they think that would actually has been a solution at any point and um you know i some of it's bravado as well you know like it's it's sort of like well if someone came into my house it's like so in my book, I talk about how a guy telling me it's, it's, if someone came to his house, he'd throw them out the front window. I'm like, that's great. And you think it's over then. If they're evil enough to come into your house, they're certainly evil enough to come back with two friends that night and burn the house down. <laughs> what are you, an idiot? You know, <laughs> so, um, but, it, but it's like yeah. it's sort of a imaginary bravado of what I would do and when in fact, probably wouldn't do it anyway and that's maybe where our theology needs to catch up to our practice maybe yes. christians are actually a lot more peaceful than they than their ideology of totally. violence <laughs> totally i've been i've been sharing with my kids um so i wrote it up on a big whiteboard uh when they were bickering and fighting <laughs> as i think most kids do but i drew like this circle and put an x at the top and said like when you hurt someone what do they do? And put another X down the bottom. Oh, well, they hurt me. It just goes around and around. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, so what we need to do is turn that X into, I put it as a cross and said, that's actually when we begin to forgive. Mm. And imagine what happens if every time someone did something bad to us, that we, instead of fighting back, instead of retaliating, we did this crazy thing that Jesus said, which was actually, we're going to love them back. We're going to do good deeds towards them. We're going to pray for them. I said, what do you think their response will be as we begin doing this? And my son was like, oh, well, they'll probably begin to love us back. And I thought, and then there's this new circle of, of forgiveness in life. And I just sort of think, you know, it, that violence is never going to end everything. Um, there will always be someone who wants to fight back. And that's, yeah. I see that as the beauty of what, what Jesus has showed us in both his life, his teaching and, on the cross is that it's a it's the the circuit breaker yes it that's the circuit, right the, the circuit of violence and you know retaliation and everything 
there's been a certain kind of literalism with revelation that, that tries to undo that very message. Cause I believe what you're sharing is not incidental to the gospel. It's actually part of the gospel. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's this idea that, well, you know, uh, he came the first time in love, but the next time he's going to come kick ass, you know, like <laughs> he's going to be, there's going to be a white horse flying across the sky and a sword coming out of his mouth and, and beheading people and the blood will flow to the bridles and all. And, and they, yeah. they forget that we have the, the clear revelation of Jesus teachings through his life and, and, and death and resurrection in the gospels. And the book of revelation is all symbols, like yeah. literally. Symbols. Yes. And yeah. What are the symbols? Well, he shows up at, Ar up at Armageddon with the blood already on his robes. Whose blood is it? It's his own mm -hmm. blood. The sword coming out of the mouth is the word or gospel, the good news. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's bringing the nations into, in, you know, and so it's a tough book. And I, but what I do know this is you don't get to use Revelation to negate Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because no. that's not what the author was doing. So, no, no, that's great. And I think. As, as I sort of progressed um, with you and with this line of thinking of having a more Christ-like God, and um, that obviously made me think, okay, well, then the gospel has to be more Christ-like, as in the, my gospel message has to be more Christ-like, and then yeah. it's moved me way further down into, okay, well, then my, what does my life look like? That has to be more Christ-like. And, um, and then the next thing that I've been looking at has been, the way I view scripture has to be more Christ-like. And I was really excited when I saw you post something um, the other day on Facebook, Brad, where you said the next one is uh, about, the, about the scriptures, how to read the scriptures. Yeah. Are, are you able to share a little bit about, about what I you am. think or where you're heading with that? Sure. So the book is called The More Christ-Like Word. And what I'm saying is that Jesus is the word of God. Right. Jesus is, the Bible says Jesus is the word of God. And that the Bible is a testimony of Jesus. Mm. So w probably the subtitle will be something like reading the Bible the Emmaus way. So mm. I go to the story of the, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, where he says that, Mo all of, that Moses and the prophets and all of the scriptures were pointing to him, mm. to the mystery of his uh, suffering and death, which lead to his resurrection and glorification. So it's all about him. And so um, Jesus becomes our lens for reading the entire scriptures. He's our rabbi. He's our sponsor into the Bible. And in fact, um, to read the Bible as a Christian, as gospel, um, as scripture, is, is to read it uh, as prefiguring and testifying to the, the, the story, the life of Christ, the life of Christ. So when when they're on the road to Emmaus, what scriptures are you talking about? It's the Old Testament. And he's telling you what they're about. Oh, yeah. these are about me. And so we need to, I, I go back to the early church and I just ask, how did they read the Old Testament as prefiguring Jesus? And what I discovered especially was this uh, St. Melito of Sardis. He, he probably, he wrote a sermon in about 165 and he is in the Johannine school. He's a disciple of disciples of jo John. And, and basically, he just, he just says, look, at every time you see um, the people of God suffering in any way in the Old Testament, it is, it is prefiguring or foreshadowing. It is a type of, this, of the much greater sufferings of Christ on the cross. Wow. When Abel dies, it prefigures Christ being murdered. When, it, when Joseph is thrown down into a pit, it prefigures Christ's arrest and his detention. And all of these are, it's pre prefiguring his suffering, but also the victories. There's a lot of dubious victories that are based in bigotry and xenophobia in the Old Testament, but they prefigure the much greater and more pure victory of Christ over that kills no one. And not one more person needs to die for the world to be set right. And then even the, you see the people of God acting unjustly all through the Old Testament. And it prefigures the injustice of the Sanhedrin and uh, Pilate's government and all those who conspired to betray and, and kill Jesus. That's how they read the Bible. Wow. And so we have no business in the old, we're not, most of us aren't Jews. We have no business in the Old Testament without a rabbi. Yeah. And we have a rabbi and his name is Jesus. And he taught us that that's what you look for.
Wow. And even if you're going to summarize the Old Testament, you summarize it as uh, the way Jesus did. His takeaway, love God, love your neighbor. This <laughs> summarizes everything. That's the point. Uh, and so, um, but what about the unchristlike pictures of God there? Well, the unchristlike pictures are a revelation of us. Mm. They reveal how badly we have projected human violence and bigotry and resentment onto God. And God lets his children tell the story. That's a Pete Enzism. Yeah. Um, God lets his children tell the story. And you see this growing tension in the scriptures that require God to come in person to set the record straight. And so John 1 says, no one's ever seen God except God, the only son, who's in the bosom of the father. He has made him known. Mm. And so, so I don't throw out the Old Testament at all. I hold it up as a mirror. Yeah. And it, and it reveals me and it reveals my misconceptions of God, but it also reveals God shining through in surprising ways to Abraham or Moses or David or Hosea. And, and you're like, oh, they're waiting for the Christ. They're waiting for the Christ like God to, mm -hmm. to, to shine fully. And so um, that's how the Bible becomes, the entire Bible becomes new covenant when read through Jesus. I love that. I love that because, I mean, even when you do read, <laughs> it's not even like that the Old Testament has one, um, like as you read through the different um, books or even in within the books of their own, there, there are contradictions of things. So you can't just say, well, the Old Testament says this because later on it gets challenged uh, maybe by another prophet or Absolutely. maybe even in the same book, um, like in, in Joshua, <laughs> you know, yes. I think that's the classic example of where uh, on one hand, the author is saying um, God was, you know, with us and we're never going to fail and we're going to win everything. And then the next chapter is like, well, but it didn't happen like that. And this is what <laughs> just sort of yeah, right. back and forth and it's all the way through. And so there needs to be a different way to read it and understand it other than, every single word being like truth um, outside of context. Like there, there needs to be some sort of context and some sort of uh, other narrative that helps us understand what's actually happening. Yeah. I call that in the, and I go into Joshua in the book as well. And I, and these are examples of how, if we say it can never contradict itself, we won't let the Bible say what it's actually saying. Mm. that's a that's abusing the bible that's not a that's a very low view of scripture yeah. to tell it what it can't do or say but if you read it and you go oh my goodness there is a this there's a polyphony of voices this is a text yeah. in trivial this is a conversation between jewish rabbis and prophets and they're going at it and it's all part of a grand scheme that i call the drama of redemption mm. and so when you read a great saga you don't you you don't act like every character agrees with each other <laughs> and you don't throw out the characters yeah. that disagree, especially not the evil ones. Darth Vader is the best part of star Wars for goodness sake. You know, you, you, you see how they fit in the story though. Yeah. And, and where the story is going and the story comes to its climax when the author himself steps into the book, which is usually a, uh, that's risky when you try to do that, but he, uh, well, got him killed. <laughs> but he came back. <laughs> I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, that's that's our story as well, isn't it? Like the the story of that Old Testament, like you said, like when we we read it and see those things, it's a reflection back onto us mm -hmm. about what we're like. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I love uh, was it Isaiah fifty three? How it says we thought that the Messiah was was uh stricken by god stricken by god but <laughs> that's one of the good buts yeah you know but there was something else going on here and and i i love that journey um that that we get to see throughout the old testament and um again i've, I've seen you do the gospel in chairs and i've seen multiple people do the gospel in chairs which just sort of you go wow like god has like there's this amazing redemptive story that is running throughout the whole bible and just beautifully portrayed in Jesus and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's the greatest story ever told. 
Yeah. So, and I think all great stories are in some way a reflection of that great story because it permeates the human um, experience. Redemption. We love redemption. We, we, it's, in, it's built into our hearts. It's going to be our telos, our fulfillment, our completion. We yeah. will finally become human <laughs> yeah. when we get so that. Good. So good. Um, but I'm just wondering, um, before we wrap up, I wonder if you have any advice uh, for those of us who have been on a bit of a journey and uh, uh, maybe people, maybe at the beginning of the journey who are sort of going, oh, wow, like they're, they're wrestling, grappling with this more Christ-like God and, and the implications of that and what that means either for the gospel or for our way of living or for reading the scripture. Do you have any advice for us of, um, I don't know, like how to anchor ourselves or how to... I don't know how to do that journey well. Yeah, I have a few thoughts on that. So um, sometimes we call this deconstruction. Uh, I much prefer other metaphors that are more gentle and honoring of where we've come from, like art restoration I got from Brian Zahn. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a, this masterpiece that we call our faith, and, and we notice that there's centuries of grime on it, and people have tried to touch it up and painted badly and so on. Well, you don't throw the painting out. It's a masterpiece under there. And also you don't, uh, you don't try to fix it with, by accumulating more stuff on it or, or using a machete for goodness, goodness <laughs> sake, you know? Um, uh, so, so we treat our faith and our hearts with care, understanding that beneath the accumulations of, of grime and, and, and bad touch-ups, um, there's something precious and priceless. So, so that would be one thing I'd say, uh, treat your journey as gently as you can. And then uh, uh, second, um, the, the solution is not to just uh, create your own religion now, because <laughs> you'll do just as badly as everyone else has. Um, so I use Christ as my anchor in it. Mm. And I, and I say, okay, I, I feel like, um, I've been restricted and I need some freedom, but I'm, I'm not going to be a kite that cuts its string and ends up in a tree crashing. Um, so, so what is my anchor point? My anchor point will be Jesus. And I will, so I'm going to saturate in the actual words of Jesus until they ooze out of me. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a gentle re uh, art restoration. It is a, a Jesus focused anchor. And then maybe I would add this, that uh, be gentle on who you were and those who still are there. So we can get arrogant sometimes <clears throat> as if like, well, now I've arrived and all those ignorant people back there, um, the, 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 the stubborn truth is that when we talk about God, we're way above our pay grade. Mm. And, and we're like toddlers with blunt crayons, <laughs> drawing pictures of God. And then <clears throat> I have this in my book, In, that's a, the, the newest one, In, in Incarnation and Inclusion. Um, and so in there, I talk about how I'm in my little cardboard box, we'll call it Christianity, and I've got these blunt crayons, and I'm three, and I'm going to draw the best picture of my daddy ever, right? And I complete it, and I hold up the panel, and here, come, here he comes, and he looks at it, and he smiles, and he hugs me, and he hangs it on his fridge. And I know now that everyone will see my picture of God as the, the truly accurate portrayal. Um, but then my friend Safi, he stands up from his box. His box is, a, is Muslim. Uh-oh. And, and he's drawn a picture of God, and he's holding it up. And Well, good. God's going to correct him now, and he's going to show him I was right and he's wrong. But lo and behold, God hugs Safi, and he actually takes his picture, and he hangs it on the fridge. I'm like, this can't be. That's, I know for sure he's wrong. And um, and so Safi is like puzzled too. Why would we have ours together? This is so weird. And then God speaks to us and he says, um, uh, I, I honor your intent mm. to worship me as best you can with what little of you know, you know of me as toddlers. Uh, and I receive that as worship. But um, I, have, I, I want you to know two things. One, please don't poke each other in the eye with your crayons. <laughs> and two, um, 
if you want to see the clearest image of me available in your world, look at your brother's face there. Mm -hmm. I will see the image of God in Safi and he sees the image of God in me. And, and, and God says, th those are much more accurate than what you drew from my fridge with wow. your little crayons. So <laughs> does that mean we shouldn't work on our conceptions of God? Absolutely not. Go for it. Does it mean all crayon drawings are equal? equal? No, absolutely not. I'm still sure mine's right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but to have a little humility and just say, look at, um, you know, I haven't arrived and nor have you. And, and not to treat others with contempt then is really important, including people from our own past. That just tells me I'm still ashamed of being a Baptist. Yeah. I need to, that I need to do the inner healing work where I can value my parents' gifts to me. Yeah. So, yeah. That's fantastic. Um, Brad, thank you so much for spending this time with me today. And um, where is the best place for people to find you and to buy your books? What works best for you? Um, I would say uh, they can find me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, just as Brad Jersak. And I have a bradjersak.com website. Um, and if you're in places like Australia or New Zealand or far away, I, um, I'm not sure the best way to find my books. Uh, they, they sell on Amazon, but also you have book depository there, I think. Sure do, yep. Um, and the only thing to know about that is, is to look for books under Bradley Jersak because they haven't combined the two names. Okay. <laughs> There's Brad Jersak and Bradley Jersak, and it's the same person, that's me. But if you do a search, you won't, you know, you might have trouble finding it. And um, I especially, I, I'd like to, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, what do you call it? Promo the in book. I, I'm really right. excited about where, what it has to teach people right now about how in Christ God has included all of in his love. Fantastic. In a way that doesn't diminish Christ. The higher your view of Christ, the wider you love, God's love appears to be. So, wow. Have a look at that one. That might need to be a conversation for another time. Yes. <laughs> I'd love to do that. Hey, thank you so much, Brad. And um, yeah, we'll, I'll, we'll put the, um, the links and everything in the, the description below so people can find you. And um, I just want to say thank you, not only for what you've done today, but for everything that you're, you're writing and, uh, and bringing to us. Um, it's making a huge difference. So thank you from Australia. <laughs> Much appreciated. We'll see you someday. <laughs>